Occupational English test. Listening test. This test has three parts. In each part, you'll hear a number of different extracts. At the start of each extract, you'll hear this sound. You'll have time to read the questions before you hear each extract, and you'll hear each extract once only. Complete your answers as you listen. At the end of the test, you'll have two minutes to check your answers. Part A. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, a health professional is talking to a patient. For questions one to twenty-four, complete the notes with information you hear. Now look at the notes for extract one. Extract one, questions one to twelve. You hear an anaesthetist talking to a patient called Mary Wilcox prior to an operation. For questions one to twelve, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. So, Mrs. Wilcox, you tell me you've had high blood pressure. So, are you taking any medications for that? Yes,、um, a blue one and a white one.、Mm -hmm. And do you know the names of the tablets? Yes, so one's thiazide. Okay. And the other one's lisinopril. Perfect. Thank you. That's very helpful. And have you had them this morning? Yes, that's what the nurse told me at the pre-assessment. Yes, so is that all right? Just、mm. with some water? I usually have them before breakfast, but she said no food at all this morning. <laughs> Excellent. And apart from the high blood pressure, do you have any other medical problems at all?、Uh, yes, I take some blood thinning drugs because I had a small heart attack a bit ago,、mm. so I'm taking aspirin. And、um, at the pre-assessment, they said to keep on with them, so I had one this morning, like I usually do.、Mm. Uh, they told me to stop the other one.、Um, I can't remember the name.、Uh, Warfarin?、Um, no, it begins with C.、Uh, Clo Clopidogrel.、Mm. Uh, they told me to stop it a week before the operation, seven days. Fantastic. So I stopped last Tuesday. Great. Now tell me a bit more about this heart attack. How long ago was that?、Uh, two years ago, my GP picked up on it. Did that all go? Yes,、uh, pretty good. And why did you go to your GP? Were you having chest pains?、Uh, they weren't chest pains. They were.、Uh, um, I was just getting a bit breathless, and it was difficult for me to tell what was going on. But、uh, Doctor Scott picked up on it when I went to see him. And、uh, he sent me to the cardiology team. Right. Did they say you'd had a heart attack? Yes, they told me I'd had a small one, and so I had some stents put in,、uh, a couple of them. And since they were done, yes, I've been better. You know, I、uh, I don't feel so tired all the time. Okay. And what can you do in terms of exercising? Well, I can do anything. Uh, uh, anything really?、Mm -hmm. um, tell me what you can do. Well, we have stairs at home, and、uh, we don't have a loo on the ground floor. It's on the first floor, so I'm up and down a few times a day.、Mm -hmm. And walking on the flats, fine. Yes, that's okay. Any problems with your ankles swelling? Well, this one it. Swells up if I've been standing.、Oh. Uh, I had my veins done, my varicose veins, 
but uh, the other one's all right. Uh, I sprained it quite badly last year, but it's fine now. Right. Um, can I just ask you a few other questions about your heart? Sure. Have you ever had any palpitations at all when your heart goes bum bum bum? Uh, no. You've never experienced any of those? Well, no, no, not really. I mean, if if I run, my heart beats a bit faster, but that's normal, isn't it? Sure. Um, anything else? Any digestive problems? No. Oh, well, if I have a heavy meal late at night, uh, like if if I have a pastry or something, I sometimes wake up in the night feeling a bit um, like heartburn. Uh, but if I take an antacid, it's fine. Right. So in general, you sound to be in pretty good shape.、Mm -hmm. Now. In a minute, I'll tell you about exactly what type of anesthesia we'll be using. But first of all, is there anything you'd like to ask me? Do you have any concerns about anything? Um. Well, I suppose the main thing is after the operation,、uh, when I wake up. Um. I mean, will I be in a lot of pain when I come round? No. You'll be given morphine during the procedure, and that will still be working when you wake up. And then, when that wears off, you'll be given something else. There'll be someone keeping an eye on you. Okay. Oh, uh, uh, the other thing is,、uh, I've heard that if you have crowns in your mouth, they can get damaged if they put in an air tube. Well, it's unlikely, but we'll take special care.、Uh, so, which teeth are we talking about?、Uh, these two. Okay, the two central incisors. And do you have any other teeth with crowns or implants? No. Okay. So what we have planned for you is to. Extract two, questions thirteen to twenty-four. You hear a consultant endocrinologist talking to a patient called Sarah Croft. For questions thirteen to twenty-four, complete the notes with a word or short phrase. You now have thirty seconds to look at the notes. Good morning, Mrs. Croft. I see your GP has referred you to me. Yes. Okay. Well, I've got some notes here with his referral letter, but it'd be helpful if you could tell me in your own words the sort of problems you've been experiencing. <sighs> okay. Well, I've had high blood pressure for several years, but these last few months that's tending to get worse.、Mm. I've been on corticosteroids too these last three years or so, and that's a result of the fact that I've suffered from asthma since my teens. I see, but I understand you've developed several other problems recently.、Oh, yeah, as you can see, my stomach is huge. I've put on a lot of weight, and it seems to be concentrated there.、Mm. And、um, oh、dear, I don't know what's happened to my face. All this hair which has appeared—it's so embarrassing. <sighs> And something else which I didn't notice at first, but which other people have pointed out to me, here, see, in between my shoulders,、oh, yeah. is this. Well, I can only describe it as a hump. 
That really bothers me too. Yes, I can see. Um, and look at my ankles. You know, they're swollen too. Something else which has got really bad is that I'm also sweating so much, even in cold weather. No amount of antiperspirant seems to help. Yeah, that must be difficult. Um, and any aches or pains? Uh, well, my, my back tends to ache a bit, but I take ibuprofen, which helps. Good. My periods used to be painful in the past, but to be honest, they're so infrequent now that the pain really isn't a problem anymore. Mm. I often feel tired, though. In fact, like really tired. And what about your skin? Oh, yeah. It seems to bruise at the slightest thing. And I've noticed that if I get a cut or a scratch or something, it takes ages to heal. And something else I've spotted on my thighs, see here is these stretch marks? Oh, yes. They're quite noticeable because they're a real purple colour. Mm. My face has changed too. I used to have quite pale skin, but as you can see, it, it's quite red now. And it looks, well, puffy. I mean, it never used to look like that. OK, so there's been quite a change. Oh, definitely. And if you look here on my neck, the skin's gone dark. Really odd. I don't know what's happening. And th though I never really had it before, I've now got acne into the bargain. Uh, no, it must all be distressing. I, I can appreciate that this is having an effect on you. Um, have you noticed your general mood changing at all? Well, it's enough to get anyone down, really. Mm. And yes, I do feel a bit depressed. But the frightening thing is that I've started getting mood swings. I've never had them before. I mean, one minute I'm laughing and the next I'm crying, and I don't know why. Mm. It's quite alarming. Anything else? Oh, I confess I feel, well, irritable all the time. Everything seems to get on my nerves, and I can't seem to concentrate like I used to. You know, I find it hard sometimes to do stuff in my head like working out a psalm or remembering names and things. Mm. I, I just hope that you can find out what's wrong with me. Well, I'm sure we will. Um, now, I see you've already had some blood tests, but I'll need to do one or two more. You've had a urine test to look at your blood sugar, so I probably won't need to repeat that. We may do a saliva test, depending on the bloods. OK, I see. And how long will everything take, I mean, before we know what's causing the problems? Well, I'm afraid it can all take some time, as diagnosis can be quite complicated, and we may need to take... That is the end of part A. Now look at part B. Part B. In this part of the test, you'll hear six different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear people talking in a different healthcare setting. For questions 25 to 30, choose the answer A, B, or C. Which fits best, according to what you hear? You'll have time to read each question before you listen. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at question 25. You hear a nurse briefing a colleague about a patient. Now read the question. OK, this is Linda. She's a 60-year-old female who was admitted through emergency with chest pains today. She's abnormal ECG with a negative troponin so far, and she's reporting a 5 for her pain. That's down from 8 on admission. She's on a cardiac diet, so she's nil by mouth from midnight, and she's OK with that. <laughs> Tomorrow morning, she's down for a stress test. She has a right forearm 20 gauge with normal saline at 75. Linda's alert and oriented, and she can ambulate with assistance. She did report some dizziness in the ER, so we have a falls risk wristband in place. 
she's aware that if she needs to go to the bathroom, she needs to press the call button, mm. but she's a bit resistant to the idea, so you need to keep an eye on her. She's also got two milligrams of morphine available for pain as needed every four hours. Okay. Question 26. You hear a GP talking to a patient who has acne. Now read the question. So how can I help you today? Well, basically, I've got a bit of acne, Doctor. I mean, I had it as a teenager, and I was given some cream which seemed to do the trick, but I can't remember what it was called. Do you think I could get some more of it? Well, it may not be the same type of acne you had before, because there are three types, actually. We call them mild, moderate, and severe. And uh, from what I can see, you seem to have mild acne. So this might just be caused by a build-up of grease on the skin. Um, how long ago are we talking about? Uh, it must be about ten years back. I was still at school. I wasn't living around here then. I see. Well, the recommended medication may have changed since then, of course. Did you have a prescription, or was it over the counter? Mm, I couldn't tell you. OK, not to worry. Uh, tell me, how long has this particular episode been going on? Uh, about three months now, and it just doesn't seem to be getting any better. I've been using special soap and stuff, trying to keep my skin clean. Uh, do you think I should see someone at the hospital? I saw online that they've got a dedicated dermatology unit. Well, I think there are a number of things we can try before we need to think about that. So let's start by discussing which soap... Question 27. You hear a surgeon briefing his team before an operation. Now read the question. Our first patient of the day is a repeat laparotomy. He's got an unexpected finding after surgery for an appendix abscess. He's got a tumour at the base of the cecum. So he's going to need a bit more of a detailed laparotomy and resection. I suspect we're going to have to convert to open surgery sooner rather than later. I wouldn't open a lot of laparostic instruments at this stage, though. We'll just see how it looks. It's a couple of months since he had his original surgery. So just an entry port and one other? Yes, that's right. We don't expect any anaesthesia problems at the beginning because he's fairly fit and well, except for his epilepsy, which is under very good control. His BMI is also 35, but it shouldn't affect us. We don't need the obesity bed for him. Question 28. You hear a nurse educator telling a group of trainees about pressure ulcers. Now read the question. As we saw last week, adult hospitalized patients are given the Norton scale to establish the risk of pressure ulcers. If, when applying the scale, the score is 5 to 10 points, that is, elevated risk. A blue sticker should be placed on the bedhead in order to inform and alert the patient, family members and the interdisciplinary team of this risk. Once the patient is placed at blue level risk, the patient and the family must be informed of the care plan established to mitigate it, and a special clock will be placed at the bedside to prompt changes in position. In the case of paediatric patients, however, the scale isn't applied. But this is to do with the limitations of the scale rather than the absence of risk. Neonates and paediatric patients hospitalised in critical areas, as well as children with limited mobility due to neurological disorders, and of course those who rely on orthopaedic devices 
products such as splints, casts, etc., are all considered at high risk. Question 29. You hear a GP talking to a patient. Now read the question. So, how can I help you today? Well, what's happened is my brother's just been told that he's got this condition where there's too much iron in his blood. I can't remember the name, but it was hemo something. Hemochromatosis? Yeah, that sounds right. I mean, he's having treatment and he's going to be okay, but apparently what the specialist told him is that this can be passed on in the genes. So, if he's got it, then there's every likelihood I've got it too that I should have a blood test, because if it's not treated, it can lead to other things, even if you've had no symptoms yet. I see. And did your brother tell you anything else? Yeah, he said it wasn't the full condition because of another thing. He read out a string of numbers and another long name. Oh, yes, I know what that might be. OK, well, let me explain a bit about this condition, and then we can decide what we need to do. Question 30. You hear two nurses conducting a handover at the change of shift. Now read the question. Next, we have Mrs. Floyd, who's sleeping at the moment. OK. She's a 60-year-old who was admitted as an emergency overnight with a suspected bowel obstruction. She has a history of bowel cancer, resected five years ago. OK. The doctors are looking into whether there might be adhesions or a stricture at the operation site. Obviously, she's concerned that the cancer may have returned, and her daughter's coming in later to speak to the doctor. That's all set up. I see. Meanwhile, her temperature is 37.8, pulses 80 beats per minute, and respiration 25 breaths a minute. Mm -hmm. Blood pressure is 150 over 90. She has a nasogastric tube on low-pressure suction to manage nausea and vomiting, and intravenous normal saline at 125 millilitres an hour. OK. The next bag needs to have potassium chloride added. Uh, see the orders for that. OK. Her skin's quite dry but intact, and you'll need to consider mouth care. That is the end of part B. Now look at part C. Part C. In this part of the test, you'll hear two different extracts. In each extract, you'll hear health professionals talking about aspects of their work. For questions 31 to 42, Choose the answer, A, B or C, which fits best, according to what you hear. Complete your answers as you listen. Now look at Extract 1. Extract 1. Questions 31 to 36. You hear an interview with a scrub nurse called Joanna Swan. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 31 to 36.
Today, I'm talking to Joanna Swan, who works as a scrub nurse in the operating theatre. Joanna, firstly, remind us what a scrub nurse is exactly and where the name comes from. Sure. Well, perioperative nurse is the correct term, of course. But basically, we're all familiar with the notion of scrubbing in. You know, you've seen surgeons doing it. It's not just washing your hands. It's doing that very thorough cleaning to ensure you're completely sterile before you go anywhere near the patient or the surgical instruments. Mm -hmm. But the name scrub nurse doesn't quite capture the full role. I mean, basically, your job's to prepare the operating room for surgery. You lay out the instruments, hand them to the surgeon when asked, and uh, you're also responsible for monitoring the patient. So you're like the bridge between the surgical team and everyone else who's supporting the patient. Mm. So how did you first get into this type of nursing? I remember one of my most formative experiences as a student nurse was shadowing a perioperative nurse in theatre. I had to scrub up too, and I was expected to lend a hand because they didn't want somebody just standing around in the way. <laughs> uh, it was all new to me, and I was worried how I'd react. I was fine around blood, but I'd never seen a wound being created before. It was a 30-minute hernia op, so nothing special, but it left a deep impression on me. Then later, uh, when I'd reached the stage in my career where I was up for a challenge, that image came back to me. Mm. And what sort of background do you need to go into this kind of nursing? Well, you can do specialist courses, but I think what's crucial is having a fair amount of nursing experience, particularly in critical care settings. That was true of me, and there's really no substitute for that. To be honest, the job wouldn't suit everybody. The hours can be gruelling and the work's very demanding. Mm. You can't just pop out to the bathroom or have a snack when you feel like it. And um, you're stuck in a small room with some quite strong personalities who are also under pressure. So it's a very intense environment, but also a very rewarding one. Mm. And what skills does it call for? Well, basically every second counts. You've got to be very efficient and able to think ahead and get things organised. You know, um, what needs doing immediately, what can wait a few moments, what you need to do now because you might not get the chance later and so on. Mm. I mean, that's the kind of thing you can train somebody for up to a point. But to do it well, you've got to be in the mindset to start with. Attention to detail is crucial. Um, if that's not how you are, then you're not going to be right for the job. You have to be there mentally 100% as well as physically. And I guess the idea of the team is really important in theatre. Mm, indeed. It's got to be part of the system. I mean, especially when you're on call, you never know who you're going to be working with. For an operating theatre to run smoothly, there's got to be clear communication and coordination between everyone concerned because it's the collaboration within the team that keeps patients alive. Mm. In my hospital, to promote team spirit, we set great store by meetings, at the preoperative briefing, of course, but also meetings to discuss issues and generate new ideas. As a nurse, it's great to feel that your voice counts, and that's not always the case in medicine. So for me, that's a big plus. We also take opportunities to debrief staff after difficult events. I mean, that's crucial too. Mm. And what about the interactions with the patients? Well, some people have the idea that in the operating theatre you're going to be having just mechanistic interventions on patients who are in no position to respond or interact with the nurse, that you're just providing support to the surgeon and the anaesthetist. But these days, theatre nurses are required to have a holistic, patient-centred approach to care. And this extends beyond the period of the patient's actual surgical experience. Preoperative visitings become the norm, so that patients see a familiar face when they come in for treatment. And this can really reduce stress levels on the day for the patient. For me, this is a really positive development, and I'm always keen to take on that role.
Now look at extract two. Extract two, questions 37 to 42. You hear a junior doctor called Graham Holder giving a presentation on the subject of hand transplants. You now have 90 seconds to read questions 37 to 42. Good morning, my name's Graham Holder. I'm a junior doctor here at the hospital. The subject of my presentation today is hand transplants. I'm not a specialist in this area and I have no direct experience of it, but I've always found it fascinating and I'd like to share my interest in it with you. So, first of all, what is a hand transplant and why is it better than prostheses? Well, it's a type of a CTA, that's a composite tissue allotransplantation, in which skin, fat, muscle and nerve bone are all transferred from one person to another. To date, it's largely been used to treat patients with both functional and aesthetic deficits that can't be dealt with by conventional methods, but this is changing. The mainstay of treatment for amputated limbs has long been prostheses, but patients often reject them because they only provide limited mobility and function, and they can be uncomfortable. In theory, at least, transplanting a complete part should give much better results than even the most advanced prosthetic technology. So, more and more upper limb transplants are being performed around the world every year, and this is largely thanks to new and more powerful immune suppressive drugs. The strategies in use have been derived from the experience of transplanting organs, especially kidneys, and this has also informed the choice of drugs. Slightly higher amounts of immune suppression are used with a potent induction followed by a low dose maintenance regime. This regime can be supplemented by short courses of intensive therapy to overcome any episode of acute rejection. The survival rate of both patients and grafts under this regimen outperforms that for all other transplants. That's actually pretty impressive. At least one episode of rejection is recorded in 90% of cases, however, despite the immune suppressive protocol, and this is much higher than with kidney transplants. One reason for this is that hand transplantation represents a visible graft. That means you can make an immediate diagnosis of rejection based on minor changes in skin appearance, even though this has to be confirmed by a biopsy. If patients adhere to the regime, however, rejection is generally reversible. One of the challenges of hand transplantation is to achieve the delicate balance that prevents rejection whilst at the same time protecting patients from the direct toxicity of the medicaments. But this seems to be working, and infection is actually the commonest complication. So, what happens during a hand transplant operation? 
It's a six hour procedure which involves two separate surgical teams, one removing the hand from the donor and the other working with the recipient. Bones are joined with titanium plates and screws. As with other bone grafts, they should eventually heal together, but the plates are left in to ensure stability. Surgeons then connect key muscles and tendons before tiny blood vessels are connected using surgical microscopes. Three major nerves are then attached, followed by large and small veins. Once blood is circulating, the recipient begins to feel the new hand. A recent case attracted a lot of interest in the UK. It was a bilateral transplant for a man who'd lost both hands in an accident at work. Now, bilateral transplants aren't so uncommon, but what made the case particularly noteworthy was the fact that he still had both his thumbs, but not the rest of his hands. So it wasn't a transplant performed at the wrist, as is usually the case, but in the substance of both hands. Nonetheless, immediately afterwards, he managed to gain some movement in his donor hands and has since improved dramatically. Indeed, just nine months after the procedure, he was able to write a thank you letter to the surgeon. His recovery experience mirrors that of most transplant patients. The incredible thing about him is the speed at which he's gained that functionality. So, what about donors? One of the challenges of hand transplantation is that the hands not only have to fit immunologically, they also have to look right because they're going to be on view, an issue that doesn't arise with internal organs. That makes the job of finding an appropriate donor even harder. In any case, because hand transplantation is rather unusual, people have been slow to donate, and there have been occasions when surgeons had to ask for a donation when somebody's offered other organs, but not specifically the hands, and that's a really difficult thing to negotiate with next of kin at the time of death. The hand transplant programme is now established and it's becoming mature. It'd be nice to think that hand transplants could become as routine as kidney transplants. Setting up a donor network is the next goal. That is the end of part C.